Hello. I thought it would be interesting to do some measurement on a couple of phono cartridges. So what I have here are two fairly popular moving magnet cartridges. I would call them probably entry level. They're like reasonably affordable. So over here we have the Audio Technica 1895E, a very popular cartridge and reasonably cheap. And over here we have a slightly more expensive Nagaoka MP110, also a very popular cartridge. The Audio Technica here sells for around 40 to 60 US dollars without the head shell, just for the cartridge itself. And if you need a new needle, you can replace it here. Uh, you can usually do that on all moving magnets. Uh, you can get a new needle for around $20. So very affordable. And the Nagaoka is a little bit more expensive. It goes for around 120 to 150 US dollars. And you can also replace the needle on this one when it gets worn out or if you have an accident. Uh, but that goes for around 50, 60 US dollars for your needle for this one. So let's have a quick look at the specs. As I mentioned, both cartridges are moving magnets. And if you take a look at the output volts, it's one kilohertz, uh, standard five centimeters per second groove. The output of the 1895E is 3.5 millivolts and the Nagoka MP110 is 5 millivolts, so there's a little bit more output on the, the Nagaoka cartridge. Channel balance, 2 dB here. Uh, that's how much difference there is between the left and the right channel. And 2 dB sounds like a reasonable figure. And for the Nagaoka, it sounds like it's a little bit better, but they say it's at 1 kilohertz. This, I don't know if this across the whole range, or it's just at 1 kilohertz. Anyway, for the Nagaoka, they say it's better than 1.5 dB, well they say it's greater than 1.5 dB, but I assume they mean it's better than 1.5 dB. And we have the channel separation, Audio Technica at 1 kHz, 20 dB. That's a little bit low, somewhere around 25 dB is a better number, but the Nagaoka is only a little bit better at 23 dB. Frequency response, 20 Hz, 20 kHz. And the same for both cartridges here. So that's not really a useful figure because it doesn't say with how much deviation. Is it like plus minus 3 dB? Is it like plus minus 6 dB? 10 dB? Whatever. No, we don't know. So this figure is not very useful. Then we have static compliance. Compliance is a little bit of a tricky parameter. It is quite important. It, it tells us how well suited a cartridge is for a specific type of tone arm. So if you have a high mass tone arm or a low mass tone arm, the cartridge compliance will tell you whether the cartridge is suited for your tone arm. However, the compliance numbers are not very standardized. So static compliance, we usually have to divide by two uh, to get the compliance as 10 Hertz. That would mean this is 10 compliance units and this one would be nine compliance units. So these are pretty reasonable figures because that means it's both cartridges will work well uh, with most tone arms, except maybe very, very low mass tone arms. Tracking force is just how much weight we're going to put on the cartridge, weight of the cartridge. So that is important, as in you need to make sure your tone arm can handle a cartridge of this weight. But this is a very reasonable weight, 6.5 grams, both of them. And we have the stylus or the diamond elliptical on both of them. This one says it's super fine polished, but well, it's both elliptical design and it looks like they're both the same size. Then we have recommended loading, 47 kilo ohm, and that's the same for both. So this is a standard for moving magnet cartridges and load capacitance, 100 to 200 picofarad. Uh, it's a reasonable figure. And the Nagawaka doesn't give any recommendations on that, but 100 to 200 picofarad is, is a reasonable figure. And it will probably work well with the Nagaoka as well. Then it says it's got a break-in period of 30 hours. I assume it is for the compliance. So the compliance has to do with uh, the rubber surround and everything holding the cantilever here. Uh, so I assume for that rubber to settle down and reach a sta stable compliance, it maybe will take up to 30 hours. And it's probably the same for the Audio Technica. And we have a couple of more numbers over here. Coil impedance at one kilohertz that's not very useful actually it's much more useful to know the dc resistance of the coil uh, but it's usually around 500 ohms something like that because 
call impedance is not useful because it's gonna change with frequency. So it's better to work with the DC resistance and then call inductance at 1 kHz for a millihenry. Uh, that can be useful if we're going to simulate the cartridge. And the price here, $40-$60 I mentioned earlier, $120-$150. Replacement stylus or replacement needle, basically the whole green part here, the whole yellow part here. For the Audio Technica, just $20. For the Nago cast right more expensive, $50 to $60. So before starting the testing, let's have a look at how the loading affects a cartridge. I have created this little model here to illustrate the effect of loading on a moving magnet phono cartridge. So it's split up in three seconds. The first section we have over here is the actual cartridge itself. First we have the coil, uh, it's set at 400 millihenry. Uh, that figure is taken from the Audio Technica datasheet. And then we have the DC resistance of this coil. I estimate that to be about 500 ohm. And over here we have the cable. So this is the cable going all the way from the phono cartridge down to the phono preamplifier. So it means it includes the small wires inside your tone arm and everything. So a cable will always have resistance. And I'll just set this to half an ohm here. And K will also always have inductance, so I estimate that to be about 2 millihenry. These two figures here are not very important in this context here, but the cable capacitance is very important. So this capacitance figure I have here, 130 picofarad, is one I got from measuring the cable on my Yamaha turntable. And over here we have the input of the phono preamplifier. So generally we don't want to have any capacitance on the phono preamplifier, but there will always be some residual capacitance, so maybe 20 picofarad is a realistic figure here. And then we have the 47 kilo ohm load resistor. So that gives us a workable model for simulating the effect of loading we'll have on the frequency response. So if we run this simulation here, you can see this is what the frequency response is going to look like. We do have a small peak up here, but it's only 0.7 dB. And a drop here at 20 kHz of about 0.7 dB as well. So this does not take into effect the actual frequency response of the cartridge. This is just the effect of loading on the cartridge, the resistive and the capacitive loading of the cartridge. So with this combined 150 picofarad and 47 kilo ohm, that gives a fairly flat frequency response. And if you remember, the Audio Technica had recommended values of 47 kilo ohm and 100 to 200 picofarad. So that looks pretty good here. However, sometimes the designers of phono preamplifiers don't think about the cable capacitance and they just read the specs for the cartridge and they say, oh, okay, we're gonna need 200 picofarad on the input of our phono preamplifier. So let's try to do that and see what effect this does have on the frequency response. Run this. And now we can see there's suddenly a 3 dB peak here and also a, well, it's almost a 4 dB fall at 20 kilohertz. So if you listen to a cartridge and say, well, it's got excessive sibilance, uh, this could be the reason. It could just be the loading that's incorrect because this will produce uh, excessive sibilance. So it's worth checking on the phono preamplifier before judging the cartridge. And it gets even worse if uh, the designer decides instead of 47 kilo ohm, maybe we want to have 100 kilo ohm. Let's try that. We set this back to 20 picofarad. And let's try run this simulation. There we go. Now suddenly we have a 60 dB peak at 20 kilohertz. Uh, that's not good. So I hope this simulation helps illustrate the importance of having the correct load, uh, both resistive or impedance and capacitance for optimal frequency response. Okay, so let's get into the actual testing. So the tests I want to perform today are frequency response, channel separation, and harmonic distortion. Before doing any testing, I have been using these two cartridges, and I estimate they have been used for about 25 to 50 hours on each of them, so they should be within optimal performance 
For the test setup, I'm using my Yamaha turntable. It's a pretty decent direct drive turntable, and it's got a pretty good arm. Got all the adjustments we need to make a cartridge perform optimally. And this thing is huge. That's a 12 inch record on the plaza there. Makes it look like a 10 inch, but it's very large record player. And for the phono preamp, I'm using a Chitmani. Uh, I've already measured this and I know the frequency response on this is flat from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz within half a dB. And I also know the input impedance is the correct 47 kilo ohm and the input capacitance is around 17, 18 picofarad. So pretty much ideal for this testing. And then I record the output here and do processing on it so we can extract the measurement data. For the frequency response test, I'll be using this record here. Uh, it's a test record made by Autophone. They're of course the manufacturer of a lot of good cartridges. Um, this test record got frequency sweeps, left right channel from 800 hertz all the way up to 50 kilohertz. And the guarantee is within one and a half dB. And there's a sheet in here with some more details. Uh, can look at it here. So a good thing about this test record is that the frequency sweep is in the outer groove, so that means it's going to be uh, as good as possible on the record. We probably have as little distortion as possible on these uh, frequency sweeps here. And another thing worth noting is that they specify this is recorded as constant velocity. And since we know that velocity equals amplitude times frequency. And we can rewrite that as amplitude equals velocity divided by frequency. So based on that we can say, well, if the velocity is constant, well, then the amplitude is going to be half every time we double the frequency. So that's equal to 6 dB per octave uh, slope. So we can use that to compensate um, the frequency sweep here. So we can turn it into a linear sweep. And here we have the first test result. So this is the frequency response of the two cartridges. So we start with the Audio Technica over here. And we can see it's, it's reasonably flat around, well, this goes from 1 kilohertz up to 30 kilohertz. And we can see it starts out quite flat here, and the two channels are well matched. And then we have a slight rise, but it's really not too much. It's probably about 2 dB at, what is that, like 15, 16 kilohertz. There's a slight difference between the two channels, maybe 1, 1.5 dB or something like that. And then around 19 kilohertz, something 18, 19 kilohertz, uh, it starts rolling off. So not bad at all. This small rise here uh, might make the cartridge sound a little bit bright because of the early rise here. And it could cause a tiny bit of sibilance, but uh, nothing too serious. Uh, generally, that's a good result. And if we move over to the Nagaoka, we can see the two channels are extremely well matched. And we can see it's incredibly flat all the way up to 10 kilohertz. But then something starts going wrong here. And we have a last peak here, 5 dB peak. I think it's probably around 17 kilohertz here. And after that, it just rolls off. That's not so great. And this peak actually looks like it's associated with loading. So either too much capacitance or too high impedance. Of course, the capacitance isn't so easy to lower because, well, we could cut our phono cable in half, then we will have half the capacitance here, but that's not very practical for other cartridges. Uh, alternatively, maybe we could try lower the 47 kilo ohm impedance to maybe 40 kilo ohm or something that would probably get rid of most of this hump here. Uh, but that will have to be in another video. Anyway, uh, other than that, it looks very good very tight matching between the two channels 
and very flat up to 10 kilohertz. So not bad, but it's a shame it's got this hump up here. Moving on to the next test result. So this is the channel separation. So the separation between the left and the right channel. And we want this value to be as high as possible. So we can see the Audio Technica here. It starts out quite well around 25 dB, but from two kilohertz down to about eight kilohertz, it goes downhill and we're all the way down to 15 dB at eight kilohertz. That's not so great. And then it starts rising a bit again and it gets a little bit messy uh, before it hit 20, 20 kilohertz and everything rolls off. So a slightly messy result here. Uh, this is going to affect the stereo imaging uh, when using this cartridge. Uh, it's probably going to be squeezed a little bit together, especially with this 15 dB at 8 kHz here. It could be a lot better. And if you look at the Nagaoka, well, they promised 23 dB channel separation, and they pretty much live up to that promise. We start out here, that's probably around 23 dB, and it keeps, it's, it's fairly constant all the way throughout the frequency range and it's really only once we hit maybe 14 15 kilohertz it drops down to about 20 db but this looks reasonably good uh, that's quite a nice result and i'll expect the stereo imaging to be a lot better on the nagaoka than on the audio technica and here we have the last measurement harmonic distortion so this is probably going to be a little bit of a shocker if you've never seen harmonic distortion measurements for phono cartridges before because they have very high distortion. Uh, if we start looking at the Audio Technica over here, so we can see it starts out 100 hertz here. Ah, it's, it's looking very good. It's just half a percent, but 200 hertz is fine. But then it starts rising, 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 and we only get to like 800 hertz when we hit 1% and 2%. It's only like 2.5 kilohertz. At 5 kilohertz, we're already up at 3% distortion. And at 10 kilohertz, we're more than 7%, almost 8% distortion. So that is quite high distortion, but it is fairly typical for phono cartridges. If we compare with the Nagaoka, it's slightly better. Start out at 0.4% distortion, and we hit 1% distortion, something like 1.2 kilohertz, and 2% distortion, about 3 kilohertz. And at 5 kilohertz, we're just below 3% distortion. And at 10 kilohertz, we're all the way up near 5% distortion. So quite high distortion. But again, the Nagaoka just slightly outperforms the Audio Technica. So you might say, well, this can't be true. We cannot have this much distortion, but I'm confident these measurements are correct. And if you try to take a look online, there are a few online magazines that have done distortion measurements for phono cartridges, and they come up with very comparable results. So this is real distortion. However, there is a redeeming factor when we look at the profile of the distortion. So this is the spectrum of the distortion. So here we have the fundamental tone and here we have the second harmonic distortion and here the third harmonic. So this is typical across the whole range. It's always dominated by second harmonic. So you can see in this example here, the second harmonic is about, what is that? Something like 36 dB down. So that would be like 2% distortion. And the third harmonic is probably about 50 dB down, so that would be like 0.3% distortion, uh, third harmonic distortion. So most people when listening to distorted music, they tend to prefer second harmonic. Uh, it just kind of adds a little bit of warmth to the music and it kind of corresponds well with people saying records maybe sounds a bit warmer than CDs. It might also have something to do with the frequency response, but clearly the distortion will also have an effect here. Whereas the third harmonic distortion is the kind that sounds pretty awful. So that's probably the reason records can sound pretty good, even though they have very high distortion. Okay, so those are all the tests I'm going to be running today. Uh, so just before I forget about it, the last uh, distortion test was done using this record here from Hi-Fi News. 
it's also a decent test record but it's got a full frequency sweep from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz so that makes it good for distortion measurements and it's both channels at the same time so it's not so good for frequency response and channel separation we can't use this one so but for a distortion measurement it does quite well so at this point uh, i would love to play you some music samples but we know youtube is not going to allow that uh, they're just going to end up blocking the video so i think there's no point in trying i could probably play a few seconds but it's really hard to hear anything just listening to a few seconds of music so unfortunately i can't do that Anyway, so would I recommend any of these cartridges? Yes, actually I would recommend both of them. I think they're both pretty good cartridges in the budget range. Of course, well, everything is relative and $120 from this cartridge here might not be budget for everyone, but compared to what vinyl enthusiasts pay for cartridges, then this is very cheap cartridge. I mean, if you have enough money, you can find a cartridge that costs $10,000, but these are a lot more approachable. So if you're on a tighter budget, I think the Audio Technica here is very good. Uh, I've listened intensively to both cartridges and I think despite the measurements it was a little bit weaker than the Nakaoka, I think still it sounds very good. And you can get a lot of good music from this cartridge here. And then there's the Nakaoka, it's slightly, slightly better, slightly more refined. And to my ears it sounds better. Of course some people might have issues with that bump in the high frequencies we saw on the frequency response but i have to say i haven't noticed it when i listen to music so personally i still listen to records probably almost daily and but i don't listen to new releases on records i mostly listen to older releases i think even though the format have a lot of weaknesses we saw the high distortion and everyone knows about the rumble and you have all the noise and ticks and stuff going on and your records maybe get scratched over time but still many albums released in the 70s and 80s uh, they will often sound better on vinyl than the re-releases or remastering on cd or digital releases so i think it's well worth having a record player if you're interested in music from that era so anyway i think that's it uh, i'm just gonna leave it here this video is getting long enough so if you have any questions comments or corrections or anything you don't agree with or want to share your own experience uh, feel free to leave a comment so thanks for watching and then i'll see you next time bye bye